let us move on to 1 D conduction ok. So, this is what we are doing is as we said as professor said we are going to do 1 D conduction. So, just to take recap of what we had derived the heat diffusion equation that is del square T by del x square plus del square T by del y square plus del square T by del z square plus q dot by k, q dot being the volumetric heat generation is equal to rho C p by k del T by del T. So, professor had told few minutes back around 215. So, if it is 1 d let us say temperature is only a function of x. So, this term would be 0, this term would be 0 and let us say there is no volumetric heat generation and I am taking steady state then this term is also 0. So, then I am, I am having only d square t by d x square equal to 0. So, he also showed that if I have two boundary conditions we can get the solution. So, that is what precisely what we are going to do in the next couple of minutes. So, this is if we take the steady state condition and if I take the plane wall, how does the plane wall look like? So, the plane wall looks like here as shown here. So, you have x equal to 0, x equal to L. So, if I draw that same thing, if I draw the same thing, this is my plane wall and I have T equal to T s 1 and T equal to T s 2 here at x equal to L that is this is x equal to 0 and this is x equal to L that is this distance is L. So, now you may ask me a question how does one generate a constant wall temperature boundary condition. So, yes one can easily in fact the easily the most easily uh, generatable uh, boundary condition in the lab is constant wall temperature that is just by making the hot water flow, hot water or cold water flow for long time. So, it will reach steady state. So, that is how in fact, this constant wall temperature boundary condition T s 1 is being generated is being this constant wall temperature boundary condition is being generated by this convective boundary condition that is h 1 comma t infinity 1. So, you have t infinity 1 here and t infinity 2 flowing here. So, that is what so, if I have this is h 1 comma t infinity 1 and this is h 2 comma t infinity 2. So, for us the boundary condition is going to be t s 1 and this is boundary condition t s 2. So, we need to generate an equation for this. What is the governing equation? Just now we found d square t by d x square equal to 0. So, what are the boundary conditions I have? x equal to 0, t equal to t s 1 and x equal to L, I have t equal to t s 2. So, now if I put this back, if I put this back with these boundary conditions, so as we, have, as we had seen if I differentiate this I get t of x equal to c 1 x plus c 2 and I have x equal to 0 t s 1 and x equal to L t s 2. So, if I substitute this for x equal to 0 I get c 2 equal to t s 1 and c 1 equal to t s 2 minus t s 1 by L. So, I get the equation as I get the equation as T of x equal to T of x equal to T s 1 plus T s 2 minus T s 1 into x by L. So, basically as you can see here this is like y equal to m x plus c m is my this slope. And of course, you can see that it is negative actually T s 1 minus T s 2 by L, it is negative slope and this is my constant. So, that is precisely what we have done here. So, you have q x equal to uh, this is the temperature distribution. Now, taking this temperature distribution, I can find the heat, heat loss or the conduction heat transfer rate that is q x equal to minus k a d t by d x, k a d t by d x is T s 1 minus T s 2 by because I am differentiating this and minus sign I have absorbed here. So, that is why T s 2 minus T s 1 has become T s 1 minus T s 2. So, heat loss rate is equal to K a into T s 1 minus T s 2. 
So, this is what I think we are all very conversant with this. So, I do not want to spend too much of time. Uh, k, k by yeah, this is no k a k l by a no q x k by l it is yeah k by l it is. It is in this equation 2.26 please note that when I divide this by a I get k by l into T s 1 minus T s 2. Okay. So, now uh, we always like to take analogies. So, here we take thermal resistance analogy. So, but then before we do this let us write down. See we have studied fluid mechanics. We have studied electricity, we are studying now heat transfer. What is common in all of this is the question. So, we all know that when there is a pressure drop, when there is a pressure drop, there is flow rate of the fluid. This all of us can feel very easily without any difficulty. So, similarly, when there is a voltage drop, then only current can flow this also very easily understandable. Similarly, for heat transfer whenever there is a temperature difference there would be heat flux. That is the delta T is the one which is causing the heat transfer. For the heat transfer to take place there has to be temperature gradient. Like when there is pressure drop only there would be flow rate. When there is pressure drop equal to 0 then the flow rate would not be there at all then the flow would not the fluid would not flow. Similarly, when there is no electrical electric potential difference there would not be current. So, it is best the best way to understand the heat flux and the temperature difference is through this analogy. I always think through flow rate and pressure drop because this is the most this is the closest one to my uh, mind. So, this is how I think. So, this is where this is how people also have done and represent this in electrical analogy. That is what we are going to do now. So, here let me skip this and move on to next one. So, I have here T s 1, T s 2, the temperature difference is T s 1 minus T s 2. So, this is Q double dash in the sorry Q heat, heat transfer rate equal to L by K A. What have I done? I have put this, this is nothing but my Fourier's law of conduction. So, what is L by K A? L by K A is my resistance that is Q equal to K A T 1 minus T 2 by L. So, if I put electrical resistance this is T 1, this is T 2 and if I take Q as my um, flow rate current. So, the resistance would be L by K A right. So, yeah. So, that is this is equal to T 1 minus T 2 upon L by K A. This is my current, this is my voltage difference delta V and this is my resistance. So, that is how we are visualizing this uh, electrical resistance analogy. Okay. So, that is what I have written here. So, similarly you can say L by K A instead of L by K A you have L by sigma A where sigma is the electrical conductivity. Okay. So, with this analogy uh, we can apply for various situations. Let us say I have convective boundary condition. So, if I have convective boundary condition by Newton's law of cooling from by Newton's law of cooling I know that Q equal to H A into T S minus T infinity. So, T s minus T infinity upon Q that is voltage difference upon current should be equal to resistance that is equal to 1 upon H A. So, that means for convection, for convection my resistance would be 1 upon H A. So, if heat transfer coefficient is high, convective resistance is going to be less. That is what we try to do in case of heat exchangers. It is too early to reach there, but still this is the significance of the convective resistance. So, now likewise we can combine all of this I just put here 
simple Fourier's law of conduction in a solid in terms of electrical resistance, and this was convection in terms of electrical resistance, and then I am combining all three. That is conduction, convection, and convection, conduction, and convection. So, if I put that, so this is my solid. And this is my T S 1 temperature, this is T S 2 and this is let us say H 1 comma T infinity 1 and this is let us say H 2 T infinity 2. So, I have T S 1 minus T S 2 upon this is my length L and this is the solid whose thermal conductivity is K and this is area is A. So, this is L upon K A. Okay. This should be equal to T infinity 1 minus T S 1 upon 1 upon H A. This also should be equal to T S 2 minus T infinity 2, assuming that this is the hot side and this is the cold side T S 2 minus T infinity 2 upon this is H 1 upon 1 upon H 2. So, this is what I am doing here, this is what I have done here. So, this is put in electrical resistance. So, if I write in terms of T infinity 1 minus T infinity 2, then I have to combine all these resistances that is heat loss or the heat transfer is equal to T infinity 1 minus T infinity 2 upon 1 upon H 1 A plus L by K A plus 1 upon H 2 A. That is what I am doing in the next slide. So, you have T infinity total resistance is this. So, this is what we are all very conversant with this, so I don't I don't want to spend too much of time on this. And we have three materials here: material A, material B, material C. Then all these resistances are in series. I can go on combining them for uh, different materials. So next next that is you have convective resistance, conductive resistance L A by K A A, conductive resistance L B by K B A and L C by K C A and 1 upon H 1 A. So, this is what is done for two different materials, but these are in series. Now, let us take up in a case in which you have materials in parallel, materials in parallel. That is here I have a material E and I have F and G parallel, but here again this H is in series. So, accordingly my resistance circuit would become so, I would have T 1 and this is the interface T 2. So, this interfacial temperature is assumed to be same. So, T 1 I have L E by K E A and this resistance would be L F by K F. Please note here I am taking A by 2 because the cross sectional area through which the heat transfer is taking place is only half here. So, that is why I am taking A by 2 okay. and here again I have L G. L g that is this length L g upon k g into a by 2. Of course, here L f equal to L g and of course, this all this has to be in series with L h by k h a. So, this is how I can rewrite the same thing for the first half and the second half and these two circuits essentially are same, they are not any different from each other. So, these are all same. So, here there is only one thing that is this is also called as overall heat transfer coefficient. I think it is little too early for Newton's law of cooling. I am skipping this overall heat transfer coefficient thing. We will reintroduce this may be in heat exchangers and in convection. For now, let us not worry too much about this U A. So, this is U means it is sort of heat transfer coefficient. Let us keep that in mind. So, now the next important thing is that see in the previous problem we just took that in this problem, we just took that at the interface there is perfect contact that is there is no gap between material A and material B, but in the real life it is not going to be so. There is going to be a gap, so and that gap is generally filled with air or water as one of your one of the participant had asked there is an interface there. So, if there is an interface this is the perfect interface that is T 1 is equal to T 2 that is this is this is the T 1 at the layer 1 end at the layer 2 beginning it is T 2, but if there is no interface T 1 is equal to T 2. That is this can be imagined that 
the layer 1 and layer 2 are held together by max by applying maximum pressure. But now let us say we have not applied any pressure and they are just held by hand. If you hold by hand, there is going to be an interface like this. That means, by naked eye we will not be able to see this interface, but if you put that under the microscope, definitely you can see those voids or the air gaps. When you see those air gaps, there is definitely the thermal conductivity is there in that void and the temperature is going to be different. That is, there is a gradient. That is, there is a heat transfer taking place within that interface. So, that is what is the thermal conductivity. That interface is essentially because of the thermal conductivity of the air and we know that the thermal conductivity of air is very less. As I said in the morning, it is 0 0.02635 as opposed to thermal conductivity of the solid which runs into tens or hundreds. So, convective that is the thermal contact resistance is going to be T 1 minus T 2 upon q x double dash and that is the interface resistance. This interface resistance is going to be very important. If I have to quote examples for this interface resistance, for example, all of us have seen on a motherboard that is a copper plate, copper thing which is there to cool the motherboard in the computer. That copper piece is glued onto the motherboard with a glue. So, the interface is created by that glue, usually that glue is called as thermal paste. The thermal paste is chosen such a way that the thermal paste thermal conductivity is reasonably high. However, high it is, it cannot match that of the solid, solid material that is the copper and the silicon, which is the motherboard material generally made of. So, the interface is a serious issue and in those, in those locations, the interfacial resistance has to be quantified. The, the only way to quantify is to measure them. You cannot model them, you have to measure. Why? Because the porosities, the way the interface is there, we cannot model that easily. So, with this intro to interfacial resistance, hello, we are just taking few questions for next 10 minutes. This is NIT Trichinopoly. Any questions? Is ah. There are two questions. Ah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Please. One is this. Uh, I understand. Yeah, I understand that uh, normally, uh, going from the normal thing, that uh, there are only two modes of heat transfer. Convection also is a form of conduction only. That's what uh, many people uh, talked about. That was one thing which came in the morning. The second thing is you are talking about the moving boundary. That question also came. In that, uh, in you said one side is convection, one side is conduction. The latent heat also will come into picture, I think when it is yeah. fusing latent heat of fusion yes. and when it is uh, yeah. melting vaporization also will come into picture, right? Yes. So, how do you solve such problems? Very complicated, how do you solve such problems? Yeah, actually. Very complicated yes, issue yes, because I tried it earlier, thermal in fact, in fact, we cannot handle this kind of problems with 1D conduction. In fact, incidentally, one of my PhD student is working on uh, melting and solidification problems. Here, there we cannot solve using 1D conduction or uh, just by taking latent heat. We have to write whole set of equations, Navier-Stokes equation and the energy equation and then put the appropriate boundary conditions and solve it. So, it is not going to be straightforward the way we had discussed in the morning. That was just a simplified presentation, but we cannot solve it thoroughly. See, for example, I said that there is natural convection in the liquid region. How can I capture natural convection? until I solve the uh, full momentum equations, all the momentum equations that is the Navier-Stokes equations and the energy equations. And people generally what they do is that for this type of problem, they assume in fact, the solid liquid interface is also not going to be clear solid and clear liquid. What they call in between these two is what is called as mushy zone. So, in this mushy zone they handle it in, the, uh, it is almost like porous medium. So, they take mushy constants and using those mushy constants, they solve these equations. So, that, so it, to answer your question, it is not going to be a straightforward simple 1D conduction either using Fourier's law or something. We have to solve whole lot of Navier-Stokes and energy equation with proper assumptions by taking porous medium, so that we can take the mushy zone into account. Over to you. What about the first question, sir, that uh, there are only two 
modes of uh, heat transfer ah, basically so you see this is a, this is a conduction and radiation ah, so that many people are still talking on that yeah see this is just a matter of opinion although we say science is objective although we say science is objective science is not objective science is also subjective i would still go by three modes of heat transfer that is conduction convection radiation although we say convection is conduction within the boundary layer but i need to handle fluid dynamics so let's keep it little different from conduction i know it is conduction within the boundary layer but that is boundary layer has to be identified so that is why if you see almost all books almost all books which we refer they say that there are three modes of heat transfer conduction convection and radiation if one wants to nitpick and hair split and argue yes there are only two modes of heat transfer over to you thank you sir thank you vit pune you can take one question impurities added will essentially decrease conductivity of the material as alloys and adding impurities of the better conducting material molecules will also decrease the conductivity of alloy yeah see i have no answer but this much i know that if i take two best conductors if i if i take copper and nickel copper thermal conductivity is very high nickel thermal conductivity is very less the alloys thermal conductivity will be lower than the both the both nickel and copper but if you ask me why i don't know okay i don't know the answer but i definitely know as you said the thermal conductivity of two pure metals are higher but when i join them or combine them the alloys thermal conductivity will be lower than the lowest among the between the two we will think about this question and come back we will put this on hold again over to you okay sir i will put this on the moodle please try to answer because i have not yet found the answer for please, all this definitely over and out sir okay so we'll get started uh, with cylinder cylindrical coordinates we are still in one dimensional heat transfer and we have a cylinder that is we have r theta z coordinates so in the r theta z coordinates what what we are saying is that the temperature is varying only in the r direction but not varying in theta and z direction so if that is the case so of course we have not derived this and i would request all the participants overnight today go back home and derive let me write this i want all of you to derive the heat diffusion equation derive the heat diffusion equation in cylindrical coordinates and spherical coordinates now let's come back so when you derive the heat diffusion equation in the cylindrical coordinates you get 1 by r d by dr kr dt by dr equal to 0 so the heat transfer rate equal to minus ka dt by dr equal to minus k a is 2 pi rl that is the surface area so you have 2 pi rl into dt by dr dt by dr yeah so professor arun wants me to write the cylindrical coordinates full heat diffusion equation so he wants me to write i definitely don't remember that equation so i am going to write it for the benefit of everyone many many places questions are asked of the time uh, of the kind please derive this equation in an exam okay it is very nice to ask such questions but the problem is it's so mathematically intensive Uh, and students often memorize these things for lack of any other way of doing it so these are not questions which i think we should be uh, focusing our attention in actual examination so you can give the equation and ask them to simplify or apply so uh, but please uh, asking for the full derivation in uh, cylindrical or spherical coordinates is not exactly the best thing to do okay so here if we see that this is the uh, heat conduction equation one dimensional heat conduction equation and this is the heat transfer rate so as you can see one important point what we need to note here is that the heat transfer the heat flux 
earlier in a plane wall heat flux is independent of x, but here it is not so. This is very important point. The conduction heat transfer rate that is q r is is is, is not independent of r, is not independent of r, but k r d t by d r is independent, but not k d t d r. So, we, we have to be very careful about this heat flux in case of cylindrical coordinates. Okay. So, so what, what is that we know, what we did for the plane wall, similarly we should do for cylindrical coordinates, that is we have to integrate this. When you integrate this, I will be getting the equation T of R equal to C 1 log of R plus C 2. So, I have two boundary conditions that is at R equal to R 1, T equal to T S 1 and at R equal to R 2, I have T equal to T S 2. So, if I substitute these boundary conditions, I will have T S 1 equal to C 1 log R 1 plus C 2, T S 2 equal to C 1 log R 2 plus C 2. So, I have T of R equal to T S 1 minus T S 2 upon log R 1 by R 2 log of R by R 2 plus T S 2. So, the point to be noted here is that the temperature distribution is no longer linear unlike plane wall, it is logarithmic, it is not linear. If you see the re heat transfer rate, so we have 2 pi L k into T S 1 minus T S 2 upon log of R 2 by R 1. So, the resistance would be the resistance would be q r equal to T s 1 minus T s 2 upon log of r r 2 by r 1 upon 2 pi L k. So, let me get back and check whether I have written no, yeah right. So, so this is this is my resistance, this is my conductive resistance which is uh, for plane wall which it was L by k a. So, it was L by k a. So, now coming back, so this is the heat transfer rate. So, now we have total heat transfer rate. Similarly, the way we did, if you get back to our problem, we have convective boundary conditions on the outer wall and convective boundary conditions on the inner wall. This is a pipe actually, what I have taken is a pipe which is having inner radius r 1 and the outer radius r 2. So, we have h 1 comma t infinity 1 on the outer wall and h 2 comma h 2 comma t infinity 2 on the inner wall. As you can see, this temperature distribution is logarithmic, but not linear. So, if I combine the same way as I did for the plane wall, I have t infinity 1 minus t infinity 2. This is you can see this is the convective resistance, this is also convective resistance these are the multiple components if I have multiple pipes of different materials of A, B and C. So, this is same as extension of plane wall. Let me re-emphasize, re-emphasize that here it is k r d t by d r which is independent of r not the conduction heat transfer rate. So, this is to be very, very, uh, very carefully noted. We should not be confusing this with the plane wall. So, this is what I had shown you, this is are the three materials, I have A, B and C. So, you have h 1 comma t infinity 1, h 2 h 4 comma t infinity 4. So, these are various conductive resistances, these are the convective resistances. You see here, one thing you can notice that these are logarithmic temperature log, uh, dips, which are there is a temperature gradient but at the wall there is a sudden jump. This is essentially this temperature gradient is within the thermal boundary layer. You can see that here also and you can see that here also. This is, a, this is the general question which students ask us, why is this temperature gradient is different? Is it linear? No, it is not linear. It is it's, that is the temperature gradient within the thermal boundary layer. It depends on how I am making the flow take place. So, definitely it is not linear. That is the point we need to note there. So, that is about the composite cylindrical wall and next is sphere. I know I am going very much fast because this is 1D conduction. So, generally I am told in the coordinators workshop that uh, these are the things which usually teachers spend more time. So, they wanted us to spend more time on heat generation and fins and transient conduction. So, that is why I am going little faster here in case of cylinder and sphere which is an extension of plane wall.
but the concepts are same. So, if I take a sphere again 1D conduction, if I take steady state 1D conduction and conduction being only in the radial direction. So, I have what is the conduction equation I have 1 by 1 by r squared del by del r of what is that k r squared d t d r k r square d t by d r this is total derivative equal to 0. Okay. So, this is equal to 0. So, we have got the equation for sphere let me write the full equation for sphere so that you know how this equation came. Of course, we are not deriving this I want all of you to write along with me so that we do not miss out things 1 upon r square del by del r of k r square del t by del r plus 1 by r square sin square theta del by del phi k del t by del phi for spherical coordinates it is going to be r theta phi. So, you have plus 1 upon r square sin theta del by del theta k sin theta del t by del theta plus q dot generated is equal to rho C p del t del t. So, what we are saying is that we are saying that the variation of temperature in the theta direction and variation of temperature in the sorry in the phi direction and in the variation of temperature in the theta direction are not there and there is no energy generation term and we are talking about steady state. So, the heat transfer or the heat diffusion equation is going to be essentially containing only this term that is what is written here that is what is written here. So, if I get back, so this is the equation which I wrote. So, and the heat flux or the heat transfer rate equal to minus k a d t d r a here is 4 pi r square d t upon d r. So, now we have if again I have a second order differential equation I need two boundary conditions I need to solve them. So, if I integrate this equation which I am not doing step by step, but that is fine I would like you to go back and derive that. So, you get T of r equal to C 1 by r plus C 2. So, if you substitute the boundary conditions at r equal to r 1 T s 1 and at r equal to r 2 T s 2. So, you are going to get two equations if you solve these two equations this is my temperature distribution definitely here again it is not linear. So, this is my temperature distribution and if I take this temperature distribution and substitute that in this heat transfer rate that is minus k a d t d r and find out d t d r using this equation. So, I get I get 4 pi k T s 1 minus T s 2 upon 1 upon r 1 minus 1 upon r 2. So, this 1 upon r 1 minus 1 upon r 2 upon 4 pi k is the conductive resistance in spherical coordinates. This is the this is the resistance in the spherical coordinates. So, before we go to this problem I just want to take a recap we will definitely uh, take up that problem I just want to take a recap of everything because 1D conduction. So, this is a very good transparency because everything is there here. So, if we take the diff heat diffusion equation 1D see we are saying that we are handling one dimensional steady state no heat generation. So, these are the governing equations d square t by d x square for plane wall this is for cylindrical wall this is for spherical wall. And if I take constant wall temperature remember we have not solved these problems for any other boundary condition we are solving only for constant wall temperature boundary conditions. So, for constant wall temperature boundary conditions these are the temperature distributions this is linear and these two are not linear. And this is the heat flux you see here this heat flux is independent of x, but these two heat fluxes are not independent of r this is the important point to note 
and this is the heat transfer rate in case of plane wall, cylindrical wall, spherical wall. And of course, these are the resistances as usual conductivity will be sitting in the denominator. That means, larger the conductivity, smaller the resistance that answers why in all heat exchangers, the heat exchanger pipes are made of copper pipes, because the thermal conductivity of copper pipe is very high. So, the conductive resistance between the two fluids is very less. Anyway, we will touch upon this again when we study heat exchangers. Now, let us come back to this problem. Spherical, there is a spherical thin walled container, which is used to store liquid nitrogen at 80 Kelvin. Note this temperature, this is much lower than the ambient temperature. It is 80 Kelvin, it is 80 Kelvin and the container has a diameter of 0.5 meters and is covered with an evacuated reflective insulation composed of silica powder. See, usually liquid nitrogen is very important and because this is what is used in most of the sensors for cooling. So, liquid nitrogen has to be carried in a container from one lab to another lab that happens even in IIT, in our IIT and most of the institutions liquid nitrogen plant will be there and liquid nitrogen will be carried. So, that liquid nitrogen container is this and this liquid nitrogen container because you see why is this insulation important here? Because there is temperature of the liquid nitrogen which is sitting in the container is at 80 Kelvin which is much much lower than the ambient temperature which is at 300 Kelvin let us say. So, here for the ambient, ambient temperature is given to be 310 Kelvin not 300 it is 310. The container has a diameter of 0.5 meter and is covered with an evacuated reflective insulation composed of silica powder. The insulation is 25 centimeters thick, sorry 25 mm thick, it is just 2.5 centimeters, not big and its outer surface is exposed to ambient, at which is at 310 Kelvin. So, at the ambient means one would expect natural convection. So, one would expect to have natural convective heat transfer coefficient and that heat transfer coefficient should not be very high, it should be of the order of tens, that is what is being said in the next sentence that is the convective heat transfer coefficient is around 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin. And the latent heat of evaporation and the density of the liquid nitrogen is 2 into 10 to the power of 5 joule per kg and 804 kg per meter cube. And the thermal conductivity of silica powder, you see the thermal conductivity as I said in the morning. Please note these numbers, I keep saying this very many times, numbers are very important for engineers. We need to know the order of magnitudes of each numbers. I keep telling this, in the morning I told thermal conductivity of copper is of the order of 400, thermal conductivity of water is of the order of 0.6, thermal conductivity of air is of the order of 0 0.026. Now, you see thermal conductivity of silica powder is 0 0.0017, you see it is two orders of magnitudes lower than the thermal conductivity of air itself, such a nice insulating material. But in spite of that, there will be leakage, that is what we are going to see now. So, question asked is, what is the rate of heat transfer to the liquid nitrogen? That is how much is the, so now where is the mode, of, which is the mode of the heat transfer? That is by convection and conduction, the heat is going to transfer from ambient, that is the atmosphere to the liquid nitrogen, because ambient is sitting at 310 and the liquid nitrogen is sitting at 80 Kelvin. And now, I have what is the rate of heat transfer to the liquid nitrogen and what is the rate of liquid boil off. This that is to calculate this liquid boil off only latent heat is required, till that time do not worry about latent heat. So, let us see how do we go about this problem. This figure is self explanatory, I have a cylinder and ambient is given sorry, sphere, it is not a cylinder, sorry, this is a sphere, the h is 20 watts per meter square Kelvin, T infinity is 310 and this is the insulating material whose thermal conductivity is 0.0017. Now, what are the, what are the known parameters I have listed, what is that we have to find also we have listed, what are the assumptions. 
definitely it has to be steady state, we have not handled so far unsteady and it has to be one dimensional in which direction, of course, radial and there is negligible resistance to the heat transfer to the container wall and the container. You see, here I am neglecting the interfacial resistance between the container wall and the insulating medium. No matter how well I wrap the insulating, insulating material, there is going to be interfacial resistance. However, I am neglecting that in this problem for the sake of simplicity. This assumption actually, this assumption that is a negligible container wall and the container inside the nitrogen that is there is no natural convection taking place inside the container, no natural convection and of course, the interfacial resistance is also not there that is not stated here and properties are assumed constant. How does it affect? If you see here, you see the thermal conductivity of silica powder is given to be at 300 Kelvin, but actually the insulating material temperature will be quite different. It will not going to be at 300 only, but still I am going to assume that the properties are going to be constant. That is the thermal conductivity is going to be constant and radiation we are excluding, radiation we are excluding. So, now with this, so if I if I write the thermal circuit, if I draw, draw the thermal circuit, I have T infinity 1 which is which is at 80 Kelvin that is inside liquid nitrogen which is sitting at T infinity 1 at 80 Kelvin and T infinity 2 which is at 310 Kelvin. So, I have two resistances here, I have two resistances. One is the conductive resistance of the container and the convective resistance because of the ambient. The conductive resistance we have just derived that is 1 upon R 1 minus 1 upon R 2 upon 4 pi k. So, R 1 and R 2 if I substitute that is 1 upon let us keep it let us keep it like that and substitute at the end. The conductive resistance is 1 upon R 1 minus 1 upon R 2 upon 4 pi k and convective resistance is 1 upon H a, a being 4 pi R 2 square. So, I have T infinity 2 and T infinity 1 that is 310 and 80 and these are the two resistances which are in series. This is what these two conductive and convective resistances are in series. So, the heat transfer rate or the rate of the heat transfer is just by plugging in all the known parameters. If I just plug in all the known parameters, it turns out that the heat transfer rate is 13.47 watts. Now, that is only first part of the problem, rate of heat transfer to the nitrogen from the ambient to the liquid nitrogen. Now, the question is at what rate the nitrogen is boiling off? That is, if there were to be a small hole here, if there were to be a small hole and definitely with this heat input, it is going to leak out. How, what is the rate at which it is going to leak out is the question. So, how will I do that? I will have to do the energy balance E dot in minus E dot out plus E dot g equal to E dot st. Here E dot g and E dot st are not there because there is no energy generation and E dot st is not there because this is a steady state problem E dot in and E dot out. What is E dot in? E dot in is the heat which is coming from the ambient to the liquid nitrogen and what is E dot out which is leaking out because of the latent heat that is m h f g. So, q equal to m h f g if I do. So, I have m dot equal to q upon h f g, q we had just found 13.47 and latent heat in the problem is given to be 2 into 10 to the power of 5 joule per kg. So, if I plug in that 13.47 upon 2 into 10 to the power of 5, I get 2 6.74 into 10 to the power of minus 5 kg per second. It sounds innocuous that means, it sounds harmless this leakage we can live with, but if you see if you convert that into volumetric basis. So, mass loss per day if I compute that for per day you see here if I multiply this kg per second and for one day how many seconds 3600 seconds for one hour and 24 hours in a day it turns out that 5.82 kilos of liquid nitrogen I am going to lose which is substantial. So, although 13.47 watts was sounding very minimal, the leakage loss is very high. So, this problem is only suggesting that the insulation is so much important 
and there needs to be no leakage. So, that is the point which is going to be which is to be understood through this problem. So, that is about cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Now, let us move on to what is called as critical radius of insulation. Will you take? In that uh, <coughs> this liquid nitrogen problem, uh, there are only two resistances given. So, just keep that in mind because actually you would have to deal with four resistances if you are going to take the conduction through the wall and any kind of convection th in the liquid nitrogen. We are making a <coughs> big assumption that temperature of the liquid nitrogen which is 80 Kelvin is equal to the temperature at the surface of inner surface of the insulating material. That is why we are able to draw the circuit diagram with only two resistances as opposed to four that would be there if I took the conduction resistance through the wall and any convective resistance in the fluid. Professor Arun will take critical radius of insulation for next maybe 15 minutes and after that we will take enough questions till the end of the session.